Dear God, we want to pray for today's message as we look into your word. God, we pray that you speak to us. Help us to be humble. Help us to receive your word. God, we pray you help us to apply your word in our lives. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Um, I've entitled today's message, The Divine Prosecution. Uh, prosecution is when there is a court case. And I don't know how many of you uh, enjoy courtroom dramas. So maybe if you have watched some movies in the past, uh, there's this old show, To Kill a Mockingbird. The climax scene is uh, a courtroom. Uh, or this show, A Few Good Men, where there is... Uh, a general who is being tried for the murder of uh, one of his subordinates. So these are some old movies that maybe you might have known. They are courtroom dramas. <coughs> or perhaps if uh, the younger people you have seen this show on TV, it's called Suits. It's about uh, two lawyers. One is a very uh, expert lawyer and one is a protege. So maybe you have seen this on show, maybe you have not. But if you have not seen any of these courtroom dramas, then maybe you have seen this last one, which also happens to be Linda's favourite. Oh, how's it? <laughs> how do you know it's Linda's favourite? Oh, you can see she's uh, her eyes are like. So what is the thing about courtroom dramas? The thing about courtroom dramas is that very often there is an accused who is guilty of some crime. Maybe he is confident that, oh, they will not find out about my crime. They will not find out that I did it. Although as the audience, we know that, oh, Definitely this person is guilty. Right, we know we have seen the backstory, but the court is trying to find out what is the evidence to bring against this criminal. And we always feel very happy when at the last part, the judge or the lawyer brings out the evidence that convicts this person of this crime. In today's passage, we actually uh, see God accusing Israel. You can almost see it as a kind of courtroom drama where because of Israel's spiritual adultery, because of Israel's idolatry, um, God is accusing Israel and condemning Israel for their deeds. Just to recap, the past three chapters of Hosea have been about Hosea and his adulterous wife, Goma. And that has been a reflection of Israel's relationship with God. Israel has been adul adulterous with uh, other gods, and uh, God is supposed to be like Hosea, the husband who is wronged. For today's passage, uh, I've broken it down into four parts. Okay? There is the charge, there is the cause, uh, the case, and the caution. So the charge is when God brings before Israel what is the accusation that God is accusing Israel of the crime. The cause is why Israel has done this crime. The case is the evidence that God is bringing before Israel, irrefutable evidence. And lastly, the caution is as we look beyond Israel, what message does God have for Judah? So let us begin first of all with the charge. <clears throat> From verse 1 in your ESV Bible, we see that God says that uh, he has a controversy against Israel. But in other versions, it says that uh, God has a charge against Israel. And what exactly is God accusing Israel of? Two things. Okay, two things we can see. First of all is that Israel has no regard for God. And secondly, that Israel has no regard for others. How does Israel have no regard for God? In Hosea chapter 4, verse 1, second part, it says, There is no faithfulness or steadfast love, and no knowledge of God in the land. What, what this means is that the people have no interest in God. They do not care about Him. They do not trust Him. They do not worship Him. Right? They do not show steadfast love which is they do not display God's character, which as his people they should, but they do not. They don't even have any knowledge about him. Okay, do not know God. What this effectively means is that Israel, okay, for Israel, God is absent in their lives, he is absent in their mind, he is absent in their hearts. Okay? And what happens as a result is that this affects the way they interact with each other. Right? Their relationship with God, this strained relationship with God affects the way they interact with each other. 
they have no allegiance, they do not display this character. So they have no regard for each other. This is the second part, verse 2, says that there is swearing, lying, murder, stealing, and committing adultery. There's breaking of all bounds and bloodshed follows bloodshed. So we can see that Israel, when they have no regard for each other, what happens? These verses, you see effectively almost all of the Ten Commandments. If you can remember the Ten Commandments, almost all of the Ten Commandments are being broken. The second part of it. Right? There's no love for our people. Okay? They are self-centered. They break all bounds. Right? This means that anything goes. Right? Whatever it takes to get ahead, whatever it takes to meet their own selfish desires, they will do it. Right? When we, when we read Matthew, we know what Jesus says when Jesus sums up the commandments. Right? Jesus says that the commandments is effectively love the Lord your God and love others as yourselves. What Israel has done here is that they have not loved God and they have no regard for others. <clears throat> now this is something that we can see in the world today, right, for sure. Every day we see godlessness all around us, in our workplace, uh, among our friends, uh, in the world, in politics, on the news, we see it. But surely even when we look in the mirror, we will see it, right? We see someone who is guilty of all these charges. When we look at ourselves, we know that we are people who have no regard for God. We are people who have no regard for others. Think about how you are at home. I know that when I look at myself, actually I'm not that bad. But I know that at home I can see Linda. Wow, I can see all of Linda's uh, uh, evilness. I can see how she is uh, often very lazy. She doesn't do any housework. She makes me do all the laundry. Uh, she's always just watching TV and always playing uh, games. Yeah, so Linda really, no, no that's me. La. <laughs> Linda does all the work. <laughs> but I know that when I look at myself at home, I can see my sinfulness. Right, for sure, for all of us, when we think about how we are, how we behave at home, in our private times, we can see our sinfulness, right? We can see our disregard for others, disregard for our family, our disregard for our spouse, uh, our disregard for our friends. Or think about yourself in church. <clears throat> How might we be thoughtless towards others in church? Maybe sometimes we do inconsiderate things. Maybe sometimes we see a brother or a sister in need, but we think that, oh, you know, my time is more important. Uh, I, I don't want to spend the effort to love them. Right? We can flip it on its head. Instead of thinking about how we uh, have no love for others, think about how can we love others. Right? Even simple things like using the utensils. Do we wash up after ourselves? Do we turn off the aircon after we use it? Do we replace the toilet paper when we use finish in the toilet? These are acts of love that I think even in church, we can start to practice. Now looking at this charge that God has brought towards Israel, right? what is the solution to all this? Is it... What is the solution to all this? When you look at all these sins that God is bringing before them, lying, murder, adultery, the first, the, well, the first thought that comes to your mind be that, okay, let's just solve these individual sins. Definitely not, right? If you have a cancer, if you have a serious disease, would you want to solve the symptoms or would you want to solve the root cause, which is the cancer? Obviously, you will want to look at the root, the root cause. Which brings us to the next part of the message, right? the cause. What is the cause behind Israel's uh, idolatry, Israel's spiritual adultery? Two things that we can learn from verse 4 to 8. The reason behind Israel's sin is, first of all, that the spiritual leaders have become corrupted. Secondly, that spiritual health, the whole nation's spiritual health, has become neglected. With regards to the spiritual leaders, look at verse 4 and 5. God says that his contention is with the priests as well as with the prophets. These are the people who are supposed to be teaching God's law, upholding God's standard. But what are they doing? They have neglected their duties. In verse 5, it says that they stumble. Right? This might seem to imply that God will bring ruin to them. Right? You shall stumble in the day and the prophets shall stumble with you by night. God will bring ruin to them because of their corruption. But stumble might also suggest that perhaps these guys, these priests, are getting drunk. Getting drunk in the day, getting drunk at night. 
verse 7, it says that maybe these guys, when they, when they succeed, when they prosper, when they have increased, then they start to sin more. Whereas they have enjoyed some sort of material prosperity, some sort of material success, and they have been carried away by it. In verse 8, it says that they are feeding on the sins of the people and being greedy for their iniquity. What does this mean? This might be referring to how in the past, when people sacrifice their sin offerings, they will bring the ram to the, the temple. And for this sin offering, after the ram is, the fat is burnt and the inner organs are burnt, what they will do is they will cook the, the, the sacrifice and the priest will eat, the eat it, will eat it. So it sounds like perhaps these priests are looking forward to these people coming to confess their sins, more so for the feast that will follow, as opposed to the confession that these people are bringing. They are not so concerned about God's hatred for sin, they are more concerned about filling their stomachs. So these are just evidences, hints, at how the spiritual leaders have become corrupted. But most importantly, look at verse 6. What have they done? They have rejected knowledge of God, and they have forgotten the law of the Lord. Right, this is exactly their, their crucial responsibility to teach the law, to uphold the law, to teach the people, but they have not done it. Right? They have lost sight of what is important and they have pursued other things. So because the priests have done this, spiritual health of all the people you can expect is obviously going to be neglected. God says that his people are destroyed because of their lack of knowledge. So it's exactly because the priests have rejected knowledge, the people themselves, you can expect them not to know the law. In summary for this portion, when God's word is far from our hearts, we will naturally be seduced by the things of the law. Right? We see that the cause of Israel's sin, the cause of Israel's idolatry, it starts first of all with this spiritual erosion of the priests, spiritual erosion of the people. The question for us is this. How much time do we give to God's word for us? Right when we receive, when we receive a message like this. It's a very serious warning, and I think we should all think about it. Right? If we want to guard our hearts against idolatry, clearly what needs to be done is that we need to focus on the law of God. Now we can read this message and say, oh, you know, um, we should look at Pastor and Chiong. Right, they are the pastors. Oh, so if they are the ones who are not responsible, then we, we can just say, oh, it's not our fault. The, pri the priests are the one. But I think it's not enough to just say that, oh, let's just look at our spiritual leaders. Right? Definitely the people themselves have a responsibility. Think about what is your attitude towards God's word. Right? We all have many Bible study opportunities. We all have many opportunities to intake uh, taking God's word. We have Sunday sermon. We have weekly IDG. Some of us attend uh, BSF. Some of us do our own quiet time at home, our own devotion. We have online Bible resources. We have online books. We even have the Bible with us everywhere we go in our smartphones. Do we treat the Bible, do we treat the Word of God with the correct reverence, with the correct attitude? Or are we the Tajik? when we come to listen Sunday sermon? Or do we dread listening to people preaching to us? Or sometimes you think about, are we more interested in listening to gossip, hearing what's the latest news about our friends, more interested than talking about God's word, discussing God's truth? Just as this passage reminds us that the cause behind sin is poor spiritual health, the solution is to fill our minds and our lives with God's word and be committed to living out this truth. So don't just be distracted by treating, with treating the symptoms of sin, but let's really look at the root cause behind our sin. Right. Now back to the courtroom drama. Okay, we've talked about the charge that God has brought. We've talked about the cause that God is, that is behind Israel's sin. Okay, we're going to go back to the courtroom drama. <laughs> Now, what God is going to do is God is going to present to Israel 
right, irrefutable evidence of their sin. He is going to bring them the case. This is all the examples of what Israel has done. Okay, all the examples of their idolatry, all the effects, or rather the key effect of their idolatry, and also the extent of their idolatry. In God's case against Israel, we see three things, right? These examples, effects, and extent. First of all, we'll look at this example of the idolatry. In all these things that Israel were doing, right, all these idolatrous practices that they were doing, what do you think Israel were hoping to achieve? What were they trying to get? Look at verse 10. In eating, they wanted satisfaction. In playing the whole, perhaps they wanted prosperity. Perhaps they wanted to multiply, they wanted success. In new wine, in whoredom, in wine itself, perhaps they wanted pleasure. Right? Elsewhere in verse 12 and 13, we talk about how they sought wisdom and oracles. So perhaps what they wanted was knowledge or wisdom. Right? This was, these are the things that they tried to achieve. Or perhaps they sought protection or security from their gods. Right? You see the mountains, you see the hills, you see the grand trees. And perhaps they think, oh, these are the things that can bring us security, can bring us strength. But actually, you look at all these things, are they, are they legitimate things? These are all legitimate things, but idolatry is when in verse, in the next verse, verse 10 and 12, when they forsake God, when they pursue these things instead of God, then that is when idolatry becomes a problem, right? It becomes when legitimate pursuits have been taken too far. When God presents these examples to Israel, surely it will resonate with them. Surely they will know, oh yes, this, these are things that are very commonplace. Sacrificing on hills, sacrificing uh, and under the trees. And straight away they will resonate. They will know that these are evidences that they cannot deny. And the truth is that, as we have mentioned, these are legitimate pursuits. But they have only become idols because they have take, been taken too far. Okay? For us, we can think about idols in our own life. Right? Legitimate pursuits that might just be taken a bit too far. Right? For example, doing well at work, pursuing our career, right? seeking that promotion. It is good, definitely a good thing. But if it is done at the expense of our spiritual life, or if we have to cut some corners at the expense of being morally upright, if we have to step on other people just to rise the corporate ladder, or we have to sacrifice our family, then perhaps work has become our idol. One of the youth shared with me how even in today, I think even in primary school, <coughs> uh, for their exams, children will steal other people's, steal other children's uh, calculator before exams just so that uh, they don't do well in their math exam, so that they can get ahead in life. I used to hear stories about this last time in uh, how, I think, Sean has shared with me before, how in university, uh, certain textbooks in the library, people will tear out the key pages so that people cannot study, or people will hide the important textbooks so that they can get ahead, right? So these are all the steps that studies have become an idol, right? So much so that we are willing to forego our uh, moral compass just so that we can get a hit. But how about in the realm of relationships? Right? Desiring companionship is natural. Right? We want to, we don't want to be alone. Loving, having a loving relationship with your spouse is also something that we should pursue. But what if that leads you to pursue a relationship with an unbeliever? Or what if for the sake of your partner, for the sake of your relationship with your partner, you start to neglect other relationships that are also important? Or you start to neglect certain responsibilities that you should be doing? Could it be that in this situation, your relationship with your wife, with your partner, with your spouse, has become an idol in your life? Has become more of a priority than what God's word says? Now these are just some examples of idolatry. Let's look at the effect. Hoarder, wine and new wine, they take away their understanding. Right? Specifically the effect 
of idolatry that happens is this. We can see how idolatry clouds our judgment. Why, why is the example given? The example is given in uh, verse 12, how people inquire of a walking stick, right, or a piece of wood. I think it's pers- purposely phrased this way, right, Hosea and God have purposely used this description to show how ridiculous their idolatry has become. Right, a walking stick that is supposed to be used by you, right, the walking stick goes where the person goes. The walking stick doesn't guide the way. Right, wherever we go, we bring the walking stick. The walking stick is at our mercy. And yet people seek wisdom and direction from the walking stick. The very thing that you are having control over. Ridiculous. Oh, something so grand. What is this? Actually, this is Bukit Tima. <laughs> Rest more. <laughs> right, when verse 13, what is the, what is the, uh, when people go to mountains, they think that, oh, this is something very grand, this is something that will give me strength. But from God's perspective, what is it? It's merely something that just gives you shape. That's as far as it gets. That's, a, that's all the power it has. Right? So you are seeking wisdom from a walking stick. You are seeking power from all these things. But the truth is that all these things can only give you shape. Right? There's nothing special about these things. And yet, people who are so stuck in idolatry, they do not see these things. They want to worship these things. Right? Idolatry clouds our judgment. That is its effect. When we are so uh, stuck in these pursuits that we have, we start to lose sight of God's truth. We start to lose sight of what is really important, what is really real. Now we look at these pursuits that these uh, Israelites have done, and we think, oh yeah, these, these are ridiculous things. But how about ourselves? Could we also be guilty of such things? Surely, right? Think about the things that we put our trust in. We put our trust in money, right? Which can effectively be said are pieces of paper. We put our trust in investments, which is what? Numbers stored in a computer, right? We put our trust in our possessions, pieces of plastic, pieces of gold, pieces of metal, pieces of wood. We are often actually doing the same thing, right? Forgetting the, the, the true thing, forgetting the true value of things, getting true worth, and being sucked into all these pursuits. We can also think about the things that bring us joy. Perhaps we think that, oh, if I just have this uh, job, if I just have this achievement in life, if I just have this uh, relationship, I will be happy. You know, sometimes we think that we just need this one thing and I will be happy. But we realize that actually it's not true. Right. After I get a promotion at work, I think, or oh, if I just get this promotion, or if I just get this pay raise, I'll be happy, I'll be contented. It's never true. <laughs> After you get this pay raise, you think, oh, how nice if I can get slightly more. Right? It will be foolish to think, and short-sighted, to think that simply by having one thing, we will be happy. Okay, without, and without the peace, and without the satisfaction that God gives, we will never be happy. When we are so caught up in our idolatry, in our pursuits, it's very easy to lose sight of the things of true worth. Okay, this is why we need to go back to what we mentioned earlier, to be humble, to prioritize our spiritual health, to know God's word, and to humbly evaluate our lives so that we do not fall into idolatry. Now that we've covered the effect of idolatry, we will go to the extent. Right? In verse 14, notice what God says with regards to the spiritual idolatry, uh, spiritual idol- adultery. He says that he will not punish these women who have committed adultery. Right? He says that he will not punish them, which sounds like a very strange thing. Why would God say such a thing? Is it that God doesn't care anymore? Or is this a judgment in itself? This might remind us of what Paul says in Romans chapter 1, verse 24, where it says that God gave them up in the last of their hearts to impurity, to this, the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Right? This was a judgment in Romans, and perhaps in Hosea, in Hosea verse 14, this is also a judgment. Think about the men and women 
who continue in their sin in uh, verse 14. What do you think they were thinking? Perhaps there is a complacency and an indifference towards the warnings of God. These people might be thinking, oh, you know, I've committed this sin. Maybe they don't even think it's a sin. But they say, oh, maybe I've committed this sin and I was not found out. You know, I've done it in my private time. I've done it away from the eyes of the public. Nobody has caught me. I can continue. And you think that, oh, because nobody has caught me, it's fine. You know? But just because it's smooth sailing doesn't mean that it's alright. This is a complacency. Okay? The extent of their idolatry, the extent of their sin, is so much so that they have become comfortable or they become numb that they are not even bothered. And these are not people that don't have the word of God. Remember, these are people who constantly have the message being preached to them. Right? We have the Bible to show us the evidence. They have people like Hosea, they have people like Isaiah who preach to them, prophets. They have the word of the Lord passed down from Moses. But clearly, the message did not affect them. Maybe they felt, ah, these prophets, they are just talking nonsense. I don't need to listen to them. When they do all this idolatry, nothing bad seems to happen. So life is still alright. They think that, okay, I don't need to heed this advice. But we know that in the years after this, right, if you look at 2 Kings verse 14, which is more or less where this, all these things are happening, you see that a few years after that, Israel will finally fall. Israel have a few more kings, but eventually they will fall because of their sin. Right? The neighboring nations will conquer them, uh, just as God had said. Now the question for us is, are we complacent? When we hear a message like this, when we hear a message of judgment, a message of uh, a message of God being angry towards sin, how do we respond? Do we think, oh, it's not for me? Do we think, uh, I'm, I'm alright, I'm, I'm more or less okay. I still go to church. Um, I still read my Bible. I'm fine. Do we think this way? Sometimes things may be smooth sailing for us, but that may not necessarily be a good thing as well. Right? Uh, don't be too quick to come to that conclusion. Because sometimes it is when there are troubles in life that we can really go. Sometimes when there are no troubles in life, that might actually be part of God's judgment already for us. Now think about how we have the privilege of God's word with us. Right? We have God's word with us everywhere we go, in our smartphones. We have message preached every Sunday. We have weekday IDG, Sunday IDG. But if our attitude is like the Israelites, then it is a problem. If our attitude is such that when we hear the message of God and we don't respond, we are not concerned, then that is a problem. And if we are too complacent, then one thing we need to do is we need to pray. Pray and ask God to help us to wake up. This might sometimes mean God sending us something terrible in our lives. Perhaps we might lose our job. Perhaps we might get a terrible disease. Or perhaps something might happen to us. Something that we don't really want. But this might be something good because this might wake us up to turn back to God. Wake us up of our complacency. Wake us up of our indifference. Now I come to the last part of the message. We look at the caution. Israel has been presented irrefutable evidence that they have sinned and that they are going to be judged. Looking beyond Israel, what does God have to say? Now remember that by this time, the nation of Israel had already split into two. Right, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, Israel and Judah. And this message is primarily for Israel. Right? God is addressing Israel in this, in this uh, message. But of course, Judah also can listen. Judah also can take heed. Right? That's why in verse 15, caution is given, saying that, okay, Judah, be careful not to become guilty yourself. Right? From verse 17 to 19, God gives the example of Ephraim. And Ephraim is also basically talking about Israel. So there are two nations, Israel and Judah. Israel is also Ephraim. So from verse 17 to 19, what does God say? He describes how Ephraim 
has been joined to idols. The rulers are described as loving shame. They are given to whoring, and soon they shall also be further shamed because of their sacrifices. So what is this? This is a warning to Judah. Don't get mixed up with Ephraim. Right? Don't get mixed up with them. Because if you do, the same thing will happen to you if you follow in their footsteps. Now, I think that besides this being a warning for Judah, this portion of uh, the passage also shows God's heart for his people. How can you see that? In verse 16, when God says, Oops, warning for Judah. I have nothing to do there. In verse 16, when God says, Like a stubborn heifer, Israel is stubborn. Can the Lord now feed them like a lamb in a broad pasture? We can still see that actually this is God's heart for Israel. Israel is the one who is being stubborn like a hyphen, which is a cow. Israel is like being a, a stubborn cow. And it is very hard, it's very hard to feed a stubborn cow. But what does God want to do? God still wants to, to feed them like a lamb in a broad pasture. The problem is that Israel are the ones who are being stubborn. But at the end of all this, Right from verse 1 up to this point, it seems like oh, God is just angry with them, angry with them. But if we look closely, we can still see hints of God's love for Israel and how God wants to prepare, how God wants to preserve the purity of Judah. Right? God still cares for his people. Let me down for two. When we encounter an account like this, where God is accusing Israel, uh, it should remind us, right? It should remind us when we read something like this, full of judgment and angry God. Uh, it should remind us that when God brings a case towards sinners, okay, there is no defense. There is nothing we can say, right? He will punish us for our ways. He will repay us for our deeds. And uh, in our weekday IDG, we are just discussing how very often nowadays we see God as sort of a teddy bear. Someone who is very cuddly, someone we can uh, we can snuggle up to, this God who will always forgive us for our sins, and it makes us feel like oh you know cheap grace, we can just do whatever we want, God will forgive us. But we need to also remind, remember this side of God, where God is angry, and God hates sin, and if we were to look at ourselves, uh, we have no hope. Okay, we have no hope because of our sins. Just like Israel, we have no defense. Now today in your responsive reading, uh, there was another trial that was taking place. That has taken place. Right? Today in this message, we have seen a trial of God versus Israel. But very thankfully, in today's uh, responsive reading, we see another trial that took place many years later. Another trial where the person who was being accused was not guilty. The person who was being accused was sinless and innocent. Right? But still that person was condemned to death. Right, when we look at um, this passage in John chapter 18 and John chapter 19, we see multiple times that actually Pilate says, I find no guilt in him. Multiple times, more than two times, three times. Pilate says, I find no guilt in him. And reading a passage like Hosea should remind us that if we were to stand before an angry God, we have no hope. We have no hope. But if we rely and we have faith in this sinless Savior, then we have hope. We, we can stand before God. Not because of what we have done, but because of what Jesus has done. So to conclude, when we encounter a passage like today, Hosea chapter 4, may it be a warning for all of us to guard against idolatry in our lives. But at the same time, may it also be a reminder that without Jesus, we have no hope before an angry God, uh, but it's only when we put our trust in this loving Saviour uh, we know we can have an eternal relationship with Him. Uh, let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for this message. Lord, it may not be a pleasant message for us to hear, uh, but Lord,
Lord, we know that we need it because it is in your word. We are sinful people and we need to be reminded of your perfect standards. God, I pray that you help us to reflect on our lives. Help us look at the idolatry and the sin in our lives. And God, I pray that you wake us up. Help us not to be complacent. Help us not to be indifferent. But Lord, help us to turn to you. That we can love you and that we can love others. God, I pray that this message will also remind us of the love that Jesus has shown us in dying for us, taking our sin, when we defenseless, uh, rotten sinners stand before you. Lord, we know we have no hope. But Lord, when we look at Jesus, Lord, we know that we can have an eternal life with you. We pray for all of us that we will continue to study your word, to keep your word close to our hearts. Because Lord, we know that is how we can guard against idolatry in our lives. God, we pray that you have mercy on us and uh, that you be with us uh, all these days that we spend. We ask all this in Jesus' name.